Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. My name is Gabriela Handel. I am a draftsman and also the host of the show, A Conversation About Art. If you're new, welcome, welcome back. If you aren't new. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 87. We are on our way to 100. And I have this con and I will have this conversation with artist Abby Lynn Bedex. If you'd like to support my channel, liking, leaving a comment and sharing this video is incredibly helpful and so is subscribing. These three are immediate and have no additional cost to you. If you'd like to support my channel with money, you can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, buying things I make on eBay, still on eBay for now. Buy, you can buy prints of my drawings or you can leave me a tip. These are all quite helpful in, in keeping this podcast and my artistic work going. The links for all of them are in the uh, caption, the show notes, the description. Thank you very much for watching and or listening and more at least more recently reading because I've been adding captions to even the hour long videos and uh, enjoy the episode. Thanks again. Okay. Abby Lynn Bedex, well, welcome to my podcast, A Conversation About Art. You are episode 87. Please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do and if I pronounced your last name correctly. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I, I like the pronunciation Bedex. It's actually Bedex, but... Bedex, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's Hungarian. Um, and yes, uh, I'm a digital artist. Um, but I also do physical art. Each work that I do, it starts off with actual pencil on paper because I like the resistance of the paper and that feel. Kind of like this puppy sketch right here. And then I scan it into my computer and then I digitally watercolor it. And um, yeah, so I've been drawing all my life like most artists. Um, and I used to draw in class a lot because it helped me focus, which is interesting. I drew hundreds and hundreds just listening to lectures. I don't know if you did that too. Yes. <laughs> but, um, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, and then as an adult, I just decided that I loved drawing and I decided that I wanted to get better at it. So I made a news resolution on New Year's in 2015 that I would draw every day. And one of the parameters was that I had to draw something different every time. So I couldn't just draw like, oh, a face every time or a female figure had to be something I'd never drawn before. And I did that for 365 days. And by the end of it, I had gotten quite a bit better because when you start at a beginner level, um, your trajectory is quite dramatic to get better. Yeah. And um, by the time I had posted all those drawings on Facebook, I had gotten a lot of people who'd seen my work and then um, commissions just started organically from there. Mm. Um, and mostly what I do is pet portraits or portraits of people. And um, I also do logos, tattoo design, sometimes a D&D &D character. Uh, the ultimate goal is, of course, to do, you know, illustrating for a book or a cover nice. would be wonderful. Yes. Just to show, like, you know, just like the actions and the movement and the story, I think would be so fun to get to do, especially someone else's story. Um, and as of right now, I think I'm sitting at about 150 or more commissions, I think. So I've been incredibly blessed to, to awesome. be able to bring in, yeah, to bring in some income from it. I feel very, very, very lucky for that. And, um, but I had a little bit of a, um, I had anxiety coming onto your podcast because I haven't done a piece of my own art and probably I'd say about a year because I had my son in August of 2022. Congratulations, by the way. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. He's, he's so fun. And so, um, <laughs> so I've been nervous about that. And then also I saw all the people that you've had on your podcast are just so incredible and I just so I'm just very humbled to be included in the ranks of anyone who you thought that you would even ask their opinion so um, and I guess uh yeah so I just want to say thank you for that and also for anyone who is an artist and is having a child it is a season and I know it's a season he's very young and I know that it will pass and I will be able to have some more time to focus on art and do that and I'm kind of just looking at it as my son is like my greatest work like mm -hmm. right now and he may mm -hmm. honestly he may even be my greatest work in my life other than you know maybe the legacy of my marriage so I don't I don't feel any resentment for it and it's wonderful so I encourage anyone 
could be a mother. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, all right. I like all of that a lot. Um, and I <laughs> particularly find, in, um, like, both like and find interesting this uh, latter, the final part about being a mother and have, being, being aware that it's a season and that it's the amount of time that is that some people would refer to as being robbed from you in a way uh is right. just it's temporary first of all mm -hmm. and it's like you have so much you're gonna have plenty of time to focus on whatever yes. it is, else you want afterwards and also what you said about how important it is in the sense that um this is kind of cheesy but i uh, i don't know if you know it, rihanna also had a kid recent somewhat recently yeah and one of, okay. i mean i didn't read a ton about it because i don't care that much but one of the quotes uh, that kind of leaked through the grapevine or whatever to us lay people is that everything before having the kid just doesn't matter, you know, oh. and, and I was like, that's, you know, that's really awesome and refreshing. That's beautiful. To, to, yeah. yeah. And, and it sounds like exactly like what it is. And it's like, you know, and, and it's, it sounds particularly appealing uh, to me because uh, I've been changing my mind about a lot of things in the last five maybe a little more now years regarding you know feminism being a woman being a mother this type of stuff and it's like i mean i'm not i don't have kids or anything it's almost too late for me because i'm 41 now so it's like i don't know if i can not sure not if it's well you know <laughs> uh, i'm aware that it's possible because you know i still get my i get my period still but um you know I, I agree with what abby is saying that it's like if you if you you're thinking about it do it <laughs> and yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah i don't know if yeah. you know suzanne venker but uh she's like yeah early the if you can have the kid early have the kid early it's like plan for, yes. for you if you have any interest in kids have them early because that's when your body is like made for doing that shit. not just like physically right. but energetically you know the energy mentally and stuff mm -hmm. it, and oh, anyway yes. yeah rambling a yeah. little bit but yeah your children you deserve that? you to be your children deserve you to be as young and vibrant as as you can be for them Totally. Yeah, and yeah. it's actually interesting. I used to have a very similar mindset where I wasn't sure how I felt about kids. And I was sort of waiting for the, the motherhood gene to pop up and that I would, I would feel compelled and feel that maternal instinct. And I sort of, I remember uh, Jordan Peterson was saying that you, you should look to the examples of your ancestors and your parents and grandparents. And, you know, if, if they're wise people and you should follow what they did because it worked for generations and generations, mm. unless you have a very good reason not to. Mm. And I didn't have a great reason not to, I'm not a CEO of anything. And I was like, I love children. And I, I had my son, it wasn't haphazard, obviously I'm 31. So it was like very planned, but I had him and I thought, oh, wow this is the most incredible thing I've ever done. Yeah. I should have done this so long ago. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, but of course, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I don't no, want to like shame anyone who hasn't had kids or doesn't want kids either. Right, Because sure. all our callings are different. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, and I mean, that's up to each individual to discover. Mm -hmm. And and well, not not just that, but also, and I think this is one of the really biggest, really big problems that I have with, with feminism is that it's like, you can choose. Mm -hmm. you can choose it's like if you want to work work if you want to have kids have kids it's like you can do both it's like that's the point of feminism is that you mm -hmm. can choose or at least that's what i thought it was uh that you mm -hmm. can choose you want to work you can choose to work you want to make a lot of money go make a lot of money it's like the point is that women can do whatever they want so choose whatever you want you know whereas yeah. whereas one of the things that pisses me off so much like again uh, uh about feminism is that it, it i just always gotten the impression that it's shits so much on being a mother wanting to stay at home yeah uh, wanting to have a guy you know take care of the money stuff and you take care of the home you know the uh home and hearth nesting you know that's a yes typically nesting, a woman thing yeah and and mm -hmm. i'm like i have you know i haven't had we haven't had kids i don't know if we will but the at least the homemaker nesting aspect it's like and taking care of my husband and cooking for oh, yeah. us grocery getting the groceries it's like i don't think i've ever felt so happy <laughs> I, oh, I didn't my heart <laughs> yeah i didn't i didn't think Beautiful. i would yeah i wouldn't i never you know younger me would never have ever thought that i could be so feel so fulfilled doing these things because mm. I, I mean i was like deliberately i was like no i'm not gonna i'm not gonna cook for anyone 
forget it. Yeah. It's like I deliberately didn't learn how to cook <laughs> until until I had to yeah. because my mom died. And then I was like, all right, so I guess I have to cook now. <laughs> and then I had to start. Right. Yeah. So it's like, I, you know, you have no choice. And anyway, I'm pretty good at it now. Thanks, especially to my husband, because he is punctilious about stuff as we were saying, and he's a, he's yes. a, he's a very good chef. And so he has, it has like rubbed off on me a little bit. So I'm better at it, but, um, yeah. Um, yes. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. I want to talk about your relationship with art <laughs> because, okay. because I'm curious that the first thing you said is that you're a digital artist, mm -hmm. even though when you start your images, you start them on paper with, yep pencil and paper. So why, why did you, why did you, I guess, use digital artist first mm -hmm. as a way to refer to yourself? And then why do you finish the work digitally? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, say I'm a digital artist because that's what the final product is. So the final product is like a high resolution digital file is the final product. I do keep a lot of the sketches if I end up liking them. Sometimes I throw them away. I'm not very emotional about them. Um, <laughs> but uh, so that's why I say it. And then also the reason why I, I do digital is because um, it's very expensive like, to buy all of the, the, the tools to do that. And I could never, I think, to do Looking digital? at all of the tools that I use, yeah, to do digital, to buy a physical media, like to actually oh. buy the watercolors and the brushes and the canvases and such. I wanted to have a, it started off as a hobby, so I picked digital because then I wouldn't have to be buying all this stuff. I could just buy a tablet, like my bamboo tablet that I've had yeah. for years, and then I would be done. So honestly, it, it was financial. And at this point, I also, I feel so much freedom from anxiety too also that um I don't feel like I'm wasting product either if I yes, end up yes. scrapping something and whatnot so I wish there was a, a more cool answer to it but that's why it's just cheaper <laughs> but I think I think that's a really good argument in favor of digital media because yeah you're not you're mm -hmm. not gonna run out of anything it's like all you need is electricity mm -hmm. so so yeah. in, so I mean you know you don't need you're not gonna run out of paper you're not, not, you're not going to have to throw away paper because your drawing didn't turn out the way you wanted. You're not going to run out of pencils. Uh, yeah. You're not going to, I don't know, you're not going to produce what is, you know, stuff that you have to put in the, in the trash bin. Mm -hmm. yep. And yeah, so, I think, yeah. yeah. No, no, go ahead, I go sorry. through like pencil lead, but that's about it. Like pencil lead I go through and then like every twice a year I have to buy a new like ream of paper to draw on that's about it and then of course you have to play for the subscription to whatever art program you use but that's about it it's in, it, you know the barrier to entry to be a digital artist I think is so low that it helps a lot of people get into it yeah yeah interesting um I wanted to ask you something just now what what uh what the, does something like procreate require like a membership thing um I don't have Procreate. I have the premium of Corel, but it is a uh, subscription. So I believe you, I believe I pay once a year and I think I pay, what do I pay? I can't remember what I pay because I have <laughs> it like re recurring and yeah. then, um, yeah. And then you just get the, you can get the upgraded program each year. And that's what I do. And I really like, I really like Corel, I guess I thought, because I also have Adobe for if I'm doing a vector image, mm -hmm. but um. I, I guess I just like the hominess of Corel, but anyways, yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty big point in favor of digital, <laughs> digital art. Because, mm -hmm. um, because yeah, you you pay at, at least for. I mean, if you're if the person is able to find a program that doesn't have a subscription, then it's mm -hmm. like you only have to pay for the tablet, basically, and that's it. And you electricity, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and you and can you can find programs that you don't need to pay for, or you know, alternate sources that for all of these programs, and you'll be fine, and you don't have to pay anything. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You can acquire yeah. the programs. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Okay. Um, yes. So, okay. So then you regularly work on graphite. You know what traditional analog mm -hmm. media and mm -hmm. digital media so and i mean i get the impression that i get the impression that 
perhaps you don't like you don't necessarily like one more than the other but could you talk about what the pros and cons are of each one besides what we said already the pros and cons of each mm -hmm. one is there anything you don't like about digital that you would wish was a little different or something yeah, yeah. um for digital, what I love about it too is that by the time I finish the file, I already have this, I have this perfectly packaged, ready to send instantly to my customer their file. Mm. So I um and most of my customers are actually from other places that I've lived. I've lived in Oregon, North Dakota, and California, and now I'm in Montana. And all the most of the places where I, I get my business, they don't even know that I'm in Montana. So and I just I'm like, okay, I'm gonna order you the canvas. Um, can you pick it up at this time or would you like it delivered to your house and they're like oh wow like and so it's just really easy and I order the canvas through a third party yeah and it they stretch it out on canvas and wood and then it gets delivered to them so that's yeah. and I that's I, the way I found that they actually look the nicest but you could also of course have them done as a poster and some people just like the high resolution file to have for their computer or to print out stickers or decals so that's a huge thing that I love about digital and then um, what I like about just traditional pencil is it just feels like home. Like you just sit in front of the paper and with that pencil in your hand, you know, yeah. when you were a kid, you don't need any toys because you could draw anything that you want. Why would you play with your toys when you could draw anything in the world and <laughs> cut it out or make whatever, you know? So I guess just like, I don't know, it, feel, it feels like home to me. And then cons about each of them. I don't know I love them I don't know if I have cons <laughs> yeah 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 because um the in the previous episode I I because the, the previous episode the um, my guest was a, a person who just draws a graph out on paper and I I like and you know even though that's also what I do I I like threw at him quote unquote two negative things that other people have said about drawing just to see what what he thought about that stuff you know because um, uh -huh. I think I think it's something about like the typical human insatisfaction with the uh, unsatisfaction, insatisfaction with like the current. It's like oh, if I have curly hair, I want straight hair. If I have yes. uh, straight hair, I want you know the other. I, I have uh, dark eyes, I want light eyes, like this type of stuff, you know. So um, something like that. So I, I guess that's kind of why I'm amused by that sort of thought exercise. And also, I don't know if you've ever heard any Ben Shapiro interviews, not his show, but interviews. Um, yeah, where, I have. Yeah, because I really like, because I think he's an attorney and, you know, by his, they, I mean, by his studies, I don't know. The thing is that when he was on Lex Friedman, I think, Lex Friedman asked, asked him what he liked about both Trump and Biden. And he was able to find uh. things that he liked and disliked about I mean so like being able to think in that way yeah. that you're able to find like the things you like and dislike or argue in mm -hmm. favor and against something I, I feel like that's a really good brain exercise just in general it is um it is. and and uh, yeah that's kind of I guess why I was wondering if there was anything of the sort about uh drawing and and uh drawing in analog and drawing in digital because Mm -hmm. I've tried, I've tried the digital, the tablet stuff, not, not thoroughly, but I have tried it uh, because mm -hmm. my husband, my husband is a web developer and, and he's, he's very up to date oh, okay. on technology stuff. He's very up to date. Yeah. On technology stuff. And he's like, cool. yeah, it's, it, that's one of those things that I was uh, talking about earlier that he's just uh, uh, focused on just being aware of these things among other being focused on other things. And so he's he's like up to date or very aware of the technology that is in his field, for example, and he's like hey so there's this uh, drawing tablet and you should you should learn how to do that and you know people people yeah. charge. Uh, people pay a lot of money for that stuff and it's in your field and uh -huh. this stuff and. And he got a tablet and I, I fiddled you know with it a little bit and I was like. I, you know, I'm not, yeah. not crazy. I'm not crazy about it um, because, I mean, it's probably not calibrated as well as it could be, but I think, I think part of it is that, I mean, I think my biggest issue with the tablet and the digital art is that the, the stylus, I don't like the way the tip of the stylus feels against the surface of the tablet. 
compared to the way- I was just way... going to say that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh-huh. No, like, are you saying because it doesn't, it doesn't feel like, like paper, it doesn't feel like it at all. Yeah. Cause there's no friction because it's very, very smooth yes. comparatively. Yes. I know. I actually, okay. Yes. I really don't like it. And that is, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about it in so long, but that is why I like to do it this way because mm-hmm. your muscle memory is such a huge part. Not like you have your intellectual knowledge of the subject that you're going to draw, but then you also have your muscle memory that comes into it as well with your hand and doing that. And the tablet completely takes that muscle memory away because it's so smooth and slippery. And um, sometimes there's like even a delay with your cursor. It's just for me, for precise like lines, I think it it took away a lot of my, the character of my art. So I was like, I'm just going to do it this way. There's no reason why I can't just draw it like that and mm-hmm. scan it in. And I don't know of anybody else who does that, but I never erase these lines or go over them with like, I never go back over with like, you know, like a marker tool or anything and go over it. I like to leave the graphite on there. And even like the marks from my hand, I keep it on the image Mm. because I like that. And I like that you can tell that it's through there. And that's why I don't use digital acrylic or digital oil. I use digital watercolor because then you can still see my graphite underneath it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So, 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 so like all of the images in that case that you've uploaded to Instagram, all of the lines are, it's a scanned drawing then. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's really yep. cool. Okay. Yeah, it's just the colors. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, that's lovely because I'm a big fan of seeing like the hand of, quote unquote, the hand of the artist in the work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Me it's too. It's like calligraphy. It's like seeing the handwriting. Oh, I love calligraphy. I wish I could do that well. <laughs> well, you could. <laughs> You could. It's hard. I took a class and I was like, oh my word. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, all right. So Miss, Miss, Mrs. Bedix, I was going to say Miss, but you're Mrs. Like me. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Bedix, yes. what is art in your opinion? Um, all right. So I, um, Like I said earlier, I did look up the dictionary definition just to give me some framework. Um, It's a work created with skill or imagination that is beautiful or expresses important things. And I actually really agree with that. I think um, that's interesting to say that it absolutely needs to have skill, I think is super important. And um, I guess the question why we're at, we're, why we're asking this is because of postmodernism, right? We're, we're trying to redefine what it is because they've undefined it and it's now it's nonsense and it can be anything. So, um, and I guess what makes me sort of upset about that is that it, it, it cheapens what art is and it makes it, it puts people who don't, not people, works of art that don't deserve to be up with the likes of say Rembrandt and Michelangelo, it puts absolute works of nonsense up there with them. And I think that's disrespectful. And it's also incredibly disrespectful to the viewer. It's implying that we don't understand what real art is and we're supposed to suspend like um, our rationality and pretend like something is art that isn't. Yeah. So um, I guess when my, I talked to my husband about it, I immediately just thought art isn't exempt from the need to be defined just because it's creative in nature. Yeah. I think um, we should try hard to define it because it's worth it and it's worth contending for it. Like, because, and we're the ones who are going to do it because I, I talked to him about it and he didn't really seem to get the whole point and the importance of it. But if you are an artist, that matters a lot. It matters what it is. So, sure, yeah. um, and um, so I said that, It is, art is creative, creativity that bounces off of a framework, which obviously framework for for any piece of art is reality. Otherwise it's chaos and confusion. And I think that it doesn't necessarily have to be beautiful, which we're gonna talk about beautiful. Um, It could be offensive. It could be, um, it could be ugly but I don't think that that means that it's chaotic or confusing. Mm -hmm. I think that it can be, it can be intellectually understood, even though it's upsetting or offensive. It shouldn't just be nonsense, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And that, uh, because obviously like if it's ugly, that in itself can be, there are important themes that need to be conveyed through ugliness and certain things that are ugly and are most certainly important. And they benefit you, which I also kind of like was wondering 
when I was thinking about the topic is art, should art be of benefit to someone? Should it benefit the viewer? And I almost think it does. Mm -hmm. I think it should maybe. If art doesn't benefit the viewer, I think then it isn't. So, <laughs> which is kind of interesting because it should elicit feelings or it could um, convey a very um, large and confusing topic and make it like palatable and understandable mm -hmm. um, and things like that. Uh, but yeah, so on the basis of framework, I'm talking about how it's ordered, it's structured. Um, I had a really good quote from G.K. Chesterton. Do you know who he is? The name, uh, I have heard the name lots of times in positive things, but I don't yeah. know who he is. He's, He's a, a turn of the 20th century guy. philosopher. Yeah. 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 And he said, art is limitation. The essence of every picture is the frame. If you draw a giraffe, you must draw him with a long neck. If in your bold and creative way, you hold yourself free to draw a giraffe with a short neck, you will really find that you are not free to draw a giraffe. So, yes. and I love that. I thought that was beautiful, which interesting that it's also about long necks, which I know that's a study that you do <laughs> and your art on long necks. I was like, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's true. That's true. Yeah. GK Chesterton, he, he knew what, it, what was up with the, those long necks, bringing up that example. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I like that a lot. Um, and I, and, and I think it relates also to what you said about how creativity bounces off or references a framework in this, you know, in this case, reality, because, um, uh, I often think that even abstract or whenever we try to make abstraction or whatever, that is still based off of reality because we're empirical creatures. So there's basically yes. no such thing as abstraction in a way, you know, mm -hmm. um, which I like a lot because it's like, oh, the abstract It's like, yeah, have you seen a nebula, bro? <laughs> Who are you kidding? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so so I like that a lot. And especially because it references that upon which we depend for everything, for sustenance, for mm -hmm. satisfaction, fulfillment, uh, being alive. And that's reality and, you know, earth and just mm -hmm. reality. So then in like in our case, when we're talking about the artistic aspect of our life, we depend on reality to be able to produce our creative to, you know, to, to follow our creative endeavor, you know? Mm -hmm. So I like that a lot. Um, and I also like, um, that you think it's important to define it mm -hmm. because, and, uh, Jordan has, and, uh, you know, for those listening, when we say Jordan, it's Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Uh, we just say Jordan because he's, uh, I don't know. Papa we say Jordan. Jordan. Yeah, hey, we're, <laughs> we're in first name basis. No, I mean, you know, he's Papa Jordan, Uncle Jordan, whatever. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, he, he has this really cool thing. It's a quote about what, where he's talking about value. And he says, I mean, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the quote itself, but he talks about how not everything has the same value because that's physically impossible. It's like, you're, you're obviously yes. going to, I mean, a person, any individual is always going to ascribe more importance to one object versus another object for whatever reason, there doesn't have to be a good reason or a bad reason. That's just how it is. And so like, Correct. um, value, I forgot what the relationship was between that. But the thing is that not everything can be valuable, just like not everything can be art. Mm -hmm. Because, yes. yeah, yes. because then that, like what you were saying, not only, I mean, it belittles art, and then that means that whatever trash, modern trash you want to think of now means that it's the same as stuff by Rembrandt, and it's obviously mm -hmm. not. It's like you can't say, or, you know, you, you can, because, of course, one can say many things, but mm -hmm. it's obviously discrepant with reality, basically, because it's like if you take... I don't want to give certain things airtime. So that's, uh, you know, you and the listener will have to imagine whatever modern trash you can imagine. And then picture it next to a Rembrandt. Love that. Don't even say it. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I've been trying really hard because I don't want I don't want certain things to occupy time and or space in my mind. So I don't even. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. yeah. So yeah, whatever you want to imagine that you just dislike. And then if you imagine that next to a Rembrandt or mm -hmm. or like any of the Michelangelo drawings, Oh. For, for example, it's like, how can you, how, how can you, it's like, how can you yeah. think that they're in the same category of art or of object of, of artifact that mm -hmm. obviously is discrepant. It makes no sense, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yes. 
Yeah, yeah. it's all the moral relativism that everything is equal to one another and that we can't trust objectivity. Everything is subjective. And if everything is subjective, then everything can be the same. So, I mean, right. it's <laughs> that in itself is like a very, is a very dangerous proposition to make, I think, because um, in art, it may just be art, but but moving moral relativism, which we're seeing now out into the world past art, I mean, has very like dangerous implications. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Cause it's like, yeah, like you're saying in the, in the case, in the case of art, it, you know, you can argue that it's relatively benign because all, all it does is make, you know, piss you and me off. But if you're talking right. about, about relative, uh, relative, uh, what did you say? Relative morals, morality, relative, relative morality. Then if you're talking about mm -hmm. how you treat other people, then that's, that's a big deal. You know, oh, it's like, yes, oh, it, it doesn't. And it's like, and you know, like I, I kind of have, it's just so short-sighted and it's, and it's short-sighted to not because, okay. So, um, okay. So maybe you can tell me whether this is nihilistic or not, but, um, okay. So, you know, if we think of earth, just earth as a whole, and you're looking at our beautiful, tiny little earth from space, it's clear that certain things just don't matter <laughs> okay mm -hmm. uh and you can and i can easily argue and i can i mean i think i have argued for myself at least or at least it makes some semblance of sense to me that the things that we think matter don't inherently matter necessarily okay but correct correct yeah but so like if you look at it in that from that point of view if you're looking at earth from outside and you're not part of this then of course it doesn't matter but to us it matters Mm -hmm. It's like if, if, you know, if you and I are having some kind of an interaction or relationship or whatever, or any kind of whatever it is that humans do, then it does matter. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. it does matter. It's like, it's like, because, you know, uh, relative morality, it, it, because you can't tell me, you know, some person who thinks that morality is relative, they can't tell me that they like it if somebody just punches them and then runs away, for example. Right. Because it's and like, oh, because, you, yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead, sorry. You're, you're advocating for moral relativism, but in reality, what they're doing is they're they're just being subjective. They're just saying what they, in the current year, believe is moral. And but next year it will change. So mm -hmm. hopefully we can keep up. So yeah, yeah, it will change. So um, yeah, I just think it's a, we can't get away from it. We can't get away from it. We just we replace whatever moral framework we don't like with our own and the more subjective it is the more dangerous it is yeah yeah in, in i just yeah i just think the subjective aspect like the argument that it's subjective is kind of short-sighted and a little juvenile mm. in the sense that be because you know i mean if if you're thinking about different cultures for example it's like yeah there's there's kind of like subtleties there's little things that matter more in one culture and that don't matter as much in another totally. culture sure but then that doesn't mean you know, that doesn't mean that there isn't like a right and wrong that is kind of mm -hmm. universal in a way. And that's something else that I like, actually, uh, that Jordan has talked about. Um, mm -hmm. He has a series of lectures. Um, well, the series I might of lectures... even be knowing what one you're talking about, because it popped into my head about JP2, and I might even be thinking about the same thing. So I'm sorry, continue. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. So so it's actually, <laughs> okay, so then I'll, I'll tell you what the lectures describe them to you, because I don't remember what they're, what they're called. They were on TV Ontario. They're about a half hour long each one, and it's about his, uh, the Maps of Meaning book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then, I mean, so... I haven't read the book, but I have listened to those lectures several times already, like all of them. And what I like about the lectures so much is that the point of the lectures is that these stories, religious mythology, and you know, yeah, including Catholic and Muslim and all, all, all religion, all mythology. It's like the, the stories have been repeating over mm -hmm. and over again. And the purpose of them is kind of to, for us to tell ourselves what works and what doesn't in terms mm -hmm, of behavior mm -hmm. and like interacting with each other and just like the greater you know being alive like really important stuff like being alive and how yeah. to live a good life yeah. and this stuff of seven and absolutely th it, that's like my takeaway from those lectures and it's always like how i mean okay not never mind how <laughs> i mean but kind of how but it's like how cool <laughs> it's like how cool is it that we had 
humans, you know, we had the, the, I don't know, like the awareness, the lucidity to pick up on that information, record it, and then tell the upcoming mm -hmm. generation, like, listen, this has worked for us for a long time. So you should do it too, mm -hmm. because it's going to work for you as well. You know? Yes. And, yes. and, and it, it gave me like this completely different view of religion as well. Cause I mean, I was raised Catholic. I mean, I don't believe in that anymore, but then it gave me this whole respect and like reverence for the religion that I grew up with. And, you know, I yeah. kind of, I want to go to church, even though like, I don't believe, but I just, I kind of, I want to go to church to like, kind of be in that thing that we did, that yeah. God is here, you know? Yes. Because yes. it's kind of amazing. You're joining in, you're joining in this tradition that our peoples have been doing for, for centuries all together and, yeah. and so much. And that's not a small thing to throw away and say, oh, religion causes all problems. I mean, you we don't understand like the full gravity of how much our faiths have like sustained our ancestors and, and how much of what we know and what we do and, and our, and the countries that we live in, but we're, we're benefiting from that. And I think there's a, a good um, quote. I can't remember who said it, but about how we stand on the shoulders of giants mm -hmm. and that's our ancestors. And, and every generation we benefit from those who came before us and the sacrifices that they made, not only just to give birth to us, but all the knowledge that they left behind. And I think it's just so arrogant to, to, uh, for a generation to just grow up and say, they didn't know anything. Yeah. They didn't know anything. Like let's rewrite the whole book everything that they said about how, how to live a good life is probably wrong, which is amazing because it's not natural to us to know how to live a good life. We naturally choose things that are very like easy and quick yeah. and maybe not the best for us. So we have to look at examples to know how to live a good life. It's not intrinsic in our nature to know that. So it's just amazes me that like some people feel the confidence to, to forge their own path in such a, destructive ways yeah 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 isn't um yeah. isn't uh chester chesterton's fence chesterton's fence? chesterton what's that it's um so it's like if you if you are walking around and you see a fence and then you're like i'm gonna knock this fence down because it's stupid yes that's um, what, i just found it yeah so is it chesterton chesterton's fence it says Chesterton's fence is a principle that says change should not be made until the reasoning behind the current state of affairs is understood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so yes. which is great. Yeah. So <laughs> don't defund the police until you have something to replace it and make sure that there's still order. Yeah. 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 Well, sorry yeah. Get, I'm sorry to get political, but. Oh, I no, 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 not at all there. I listened to, uh, not to mention that if you leave, if you not you necessarily, but whomever says this type of stuff, if you live in a nice safe neighborhood, then don't go screaming deep on the police. Or if you live in a privately guarded building, don't act mm -hmm. like the police is bad or something. Uh, but, but yeah, right. yeah, no, but it's just like the, I think the Chesterton's, cause I guess that's one of the places where I have li uh, heard his name. Um, <laughs> It's, um, I don't know if it's the same guy. Is it the same oh, guy? Yeah? Yeah, oh, it, it is. is. It is. Okay, cool. Right. Yes, you nice. got it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you know, when it comes to to acting like art or whatever or meaning of, of anything is relative or subjective or mm -hmm. just whatever, like it doesn't deserve to have the kind of like the authority that it has, then it's like, you know, don't, don't, unless you know what that is or why it's there or how it got there, then mm -hmm. don't try getting rid of it because you probably yourself need it, you know? Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's just, it's just frustrating to me. Um, and yeah, it's uh, modernists and postmodernists. It's like, I totally, um, and well, I doubt that they thought about all that stuff themselves, because of course, you know, um, mm -hmm. like I like I was saying earlier, it's like we're empirical. We don't just think of stuff, um, you know. Like um, nature is iterative in that every time something new is made, it's a little bit different from the previous example. It's like you know, you had you had your mm -hmm. kid, and it's obviously a human, but he's a little bit different from you and the dad, 
you know, or like, you right. know, if, if you think of leaves of, a, of the same tree, it's like each leaf is a little bit different from the previous one. So, mm -hmm. so then similarly with ideas, you know, it's like the modernists, the yes. most modernists didn't come up with all that shit on them for themselves. And, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I think it might've, sometimes I think that it might have started even way, way, way before, like even when Leonardo and Michelangelo wanted to make art super rational and brainy and stuff. Sometimes yes. I think <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, I can, how we, I can get how you know those takes might be might be a little constraining to the artist, but sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, just as just as mental exercises. Sometimes, sometimes I think it'd be interesting to maybe chase where the idea first took uh, presence or form. You know, started taking form. Mm -hmm. um yes okay okay i must ask you other things um okay <laughs> mrs Bedix, what is beauty in your opinion beauty this one was harder than art in my opinion i think because i didn't i hadn't thought about it before and i i didn't have a bone to pick with it like i did with what is art so but uh -huh. <laughs> yeah um uh, so I believe the technical definition is something that is aesthetically pleasing in shape, color, or form. And I love that. I love that it that it gives pleasure and that it is categorized. It has boundaries, shape, colors, and forms. So those are categories. So um, I would say that beauty is orderly and it's good. Mm. So I, I think good because producing pleasure is good but because it is beautiful it's truthful so it's truth and truth is good does that make sense yes so it's not like you doing some um horrible thing that's sinful but it feels good and then you know so that's beautiful it also needs to be um truthful and good so i think for something to be beautiful and um so like as far as like orderly that would be symmetry um, specific colors, so not all mushed together to make brown color, color, color. Um, specific boundaries, like a shape or a form, um, like even like principles, like the golden ratio or like artistic numbers of three, things like that. Those all encompass, I think they're in the category of beauty. And um, so as far as truth, that one was a little bit more abstract and it sort of came to me and I didn't really want it to be part of the definition, but I couldn't really escape it. I think it is one, in my mm -hmm. opinion, mm -hmm. and that may just be as a Christian that beauty is truth. And I think that maybe part of it is that truth is absolutely what it is. It's not hiding any million possibilities that it could be something else or that it's wearing a mask. And there's, there's all these possibilities that it could be something else that it is. And that's kind of terrifying, but mm. beauty is just what it is. And that's truthful. And in that like safety and honesty, that's good. Mm. If that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So as an ideal, I, and beauty is an ideal. I don't, I think that beauty has been demonized, but that's if you're putting in other things into it, like, um, like vanity or, um, um, an unnatural or, uh, like consumer driven, vanity and beauty i think mm -hmm. that we kind of conflate the two but beauty itself i believe is a true ideal and good because it doesn't just have to be a work of art it can be it's also i think it beauty is virtue and in the bible virtue and beauty are not synonymous but virtue is beautiful and virtue is beauty so they're they're very similar so mm -hmm. i think that it's hard as a christian to get away from that mm -hmm. so but yeah and then I, what did I see? I found this, um, do you know who, well, you probably don't know who he is, but you are Catholic. Frank Ami finds a Catholic. You're Catholic. You know him, right? <laughs> <laughs> so his name's Frank La Roca or Roca, and he's a composer of, I believe, a few Catholic masses. And he says, beauty is the visible form of good. And good is the metaphysical form of beauty. And I think that that's very true. Yeah, I like that. Um, would you repeat it, please? Yes. Uh, beauty is the visible form of good. And good is the metaphysical form of beauty. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I like that a lot. Okay. So, um, yes, I have questions. Yes. Um, okay. So, so, um, okay. So when you were talking about truth, mm -hmm. 
so truth is something because um, because I mean uh, weirdly enough, even though I kind of think I understand like the concept of what truth is, I I'm not mm -hmm. sure that I, anyway. The thing is that so is this accurate? Is truth something that is not subject to interpretation? Yes, not subjective, not relative. It's not. It's I I would say it's it's absolutely like objective and it it's um and it's timeless and it never changes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. so, okay, so I want to try to think of a couple of things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, death, <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. Death, because it applies to, well, it applies to every living being in some capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, okay, so if, if I'm thinking of not subject to interpretation, that's kind of what I can limit it to, because if I, if we wanted to talk like about energy and matter, I think it could be applicable also in a way, but for sure to living beings, because like living beings are living at some point and then they're not. Yeah. And then then they're just going to not be living. And that's a matter of fact. And just not be living. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yes. So. Uh huh. So, okay. Okay, I know it was a little bit of an interesting concept for me. And I know if I had had some more studies on philosophy, I would, um, I would be able to define it better. But for me, it was more looking at it from a biblical worldview, which I suppose is Western, a Western worldview, I would, um, it would be saying that, like, if it's, it's virtuous, that beauty is virtuous, and beauty in itself is a virtue. And um, like, be, because beauty doesn't just have to be on a physical human being, it's, it can be in the beautiful world that we see, it can be in someone telling the truth, it can be in, you know, a baby being born, things like that, I think that's beautiful and something that is beautiful could never hold a lie and could never be deceitful mm -hmm. and could never um could never what do you call it uh what do you call it when something is almost like veiled anyways it, it it's not anything other than what it is and i think the honesty and reality of that that that's why beauty is truth because it can't be a lie i think mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So I'd like to talk, I, I, I would like it if we, I just said I had other stuff. All right. All right. All right. So let's start with this thing. So, so, okay. So, cause you said you didn't have a bone to pick with beauty at first. And I thought that was a curious thing to say. So, you, mm -hmm. so, so you, so does that mean that you felt more, does that mean that you felt like you understand more what beauty, beauty is than what art is? Um, I think I just feel like beauty cannot be attacked. Beauty is what it is. And no matter what anyone says or tries to redefine or push another type of beauty, we all know that beauty is a virtue in and of itself. And I think that we intrinsically know and in like our neurons, we're able to identify and know what it is. And so I suppose I'm not worried about the redefining of beauty mm -hmm. because it can't be. Mm -hmm. But I am worried about the redefining of art because that is its own in reality. It is its own industry. It is its own work. Um, and I think that the redefining of it can really hurt art in general. Mm -hmm. So if that makes sense. Okay. So, so you don't think, so you don't think that beauty has suffered from this relativism type, this postmodernist relativism, the way art has. Oh, it has, I suppose maybe I'm just not as concerned about it because great question it has been affected you're absolutely right it has been affected but I suppose I just look at it as has it really or are we just trying to push something but nobody's really biting mm. well yeah but then but then the can't but then wouldn't you say that that's also kind of applicable to art in that case because and I'm asking that because when mm -hmm. I was younger and I didn't ask as many questions as I ask now um mm -hmm. I was like all right, I mean, I guess I can't judge these people making quote, mm -hmm. one of this wannabe art, even though yeah. it doesn't make sense to me that my drawings, uh, which I make thoughtfully and carefully, have to compete with this stuff for whatever reason. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't make sense to mm -hmm. me that this, this is the same as that. So, so um, do you think in that case that maybe your own definition of art was affected or do you think 
or you temporarily affected or or like you you felt like you had to tolerate it or or I don't know. Oh, so the, the question is like, how did is the you're asking me why the question about art was more like hit home more for me? Uh, I guess so. Yeah, because yeah, because I guess I have the impression that, that you seem pretty straightforward about how you feel about beauty, but then with and I mean I I don't obviously don't blame you or anything because it's like you know if you have so much in, so much information coming saying otherwise or mm -hmm. saying this or that from everywhere, then it's easy to be like, oh, I guess I am maybe I'm wrong, you know. Um, yeah. So then, because yeah. yeah, you seem. Um, I guess I just have the impression that uh, your relationship with beauty seems pretty straightforward versus your relationship with art is like. Hmm. It's probably because yeah, I am an artist. That's probably why okay, I don't. Yeah. And I, I, I suppose because it's it's mine. Mm -hmm. I, I feel a part of it. I feel it's so important to me and the concept of beauty to me because. And I bet, I bet if I was a model or. I bet if I was a model or in the cosmetics industry or in fashion or in marketing of some sort, you know, maybe in the movie industry, I bet that the concept of beauty would bother me more. I bet it yeah, would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I oh. think it would. Because for now, the only way it really affects me is in the way that it's connected to art. And then also just in, you know, if I if I feel beautiful, but I, you know, I, I have a husband and he likes me, so I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay, so then all right, so then from that, I guess um I also wanted to ask you about the visual aspect. Um because I've been musing, you know, based on what other people have told me regarding beauty. Mm -hmm. I have been musing about how beauty isn't a visual thing, but the visual thing is kind of like the last thing that we get from beauty that is or kind of like the end result of it. And so one example, mm -hmm. for example, one example that I can give you is, um, for example, if you have a person that is overweight, you know, they're depressed and they're unhappy, whatever it is, and then you have the same person who's very healthy, they're very happy, uh, they live mm -hmm. a fulfilled life and whatever it is, whatever meaning, all that, all that stuff, the person, the latter person is obviously more attractive and arguably beautiful right mm -hmm. uh it, it's same person and obviously the one person that is healthy and fulfilled and stuff is obviously going to be glowing and beautiful yes. so then so then that is an internal process that mm -hmm. ends up showing on the outside as a visual result um and, yes. and 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 also i guess the reason for which i started thinking that another part for which i started thinking that is that it, it would explain why one person or different people can see beauty in things that are arguably unattractive or ugly, like yes. uh, a rotting fruit or roadkill, like this type of, you know, like a little dead animal, this type of stuff, um, mm -hmm. versus like, oh my God, a tree, uh, exuberant, beautiful yeah. tree, you know, the flowering on the spring, this type of stuff, you know, so, so then... I have the impression that it's maybe like a, an internal feeling and then that is what is the same for everyone like that experience of beauty is the same for everyone and you and and, yeah. and um I don't know what do you what do you think about that I love that so you're saying that it's internal and it's from it's obviously it's it can be objectively beautiful because we would all have the same reactions, right? Even though it's internal and it's our interpretation, we all would have that same reaction to it. And it's not that the roadkill is beautiful, but it's that what we see in it or the feeling that it elicits maybe was beautiful in sort of a like creepy, eerie, um, hauntingly beautiful sort of look way. And you feel that and that's how you see the beauty because you felt it. And so even though objectively the possum isn't isn't the dead possum isn't beautiful the feeling that you got the that it was elicited within you is beautiful and everybody who had that same feeling it would be beautiful as well if they thought the same thing when they saw it is that what you're saying yeah yeah that the experience of beauty is the same for everyone yes. so like the way that it I feels within agree. yeah 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 Mm -hmm. But I think that that's very hard to suss out unless you really, unless like you have, you think about that because otherwise 
it, it on the surface looks like everything is subjective. I think skeletons are beautiful. I'm so edgy. Like, you know, <laughs> right. and I don't, I don't think Barbie's beautiful. I think Barbie's ugly. So yes. it's, but <laughs> classic. Yeah. But you would, yes. But your feeling of seeing, seeing beauty would be the same and you could find beauty in one and, and in the other and so forth. I agree. I think that's very insightful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and, uh, yeah, I think it, you know, I think it has something to do with something that you said earlier about how we that our tendency is to go for the easiest thing mm -hmm. uh the least effort thing and and you know that's actually i mean nature in general will take the path of least resistance mm -hmm. you know like things in nature will take the path of least resistance um so then it's easier what is easier is to conclude that the way something looks is what makes something beautiful Ooh, you see what i'm saying that's good Yes. Yeah. So, so like, so, so like, um, but then it takes, it, it takes a little, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it took me a while to be like, but wait, that, I mean, that doesn't make sense because then there would be many more people that are attracted to uh, considered beautiful by everyone. And I mean, that's, there are, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. beauty standards are cross-cultural and cross time. Um, mm -hmm. but But, you I think know. what we're trying to do is we're almost trying to figure out maybe the outliers because we know that there are some objective principles of beauty that are pretty standard yeah. and most people will find something beautiful if they follow these parameters. Mm. But I think we're also wondering, you know, what does that account for? You know, and we're talking about like roadkill or rotting fruit. So what is that about that that could also elicit beauty? And so like you're saying is that it doesn't just have to be on the outside, that it can also be um, our experience of it which is kind of how art is, right? Because art doesn't necessarily have to be palatable or happy. It can be heart-wrenching and uh, painful and offensive, but it's some of the feelings that it elicits are beautiful and are necessary. So, yeah. Um, yeah, actually I meant, I meant, uh, cause um, you mentioned that's this, these very things when you were talking about art and I wonder if you could elaborate mm -hmm. on that a little bit. So do you have examples of work that, uh, maybe upon first seeing them, you consider them to be offensive or, or just ugly, but then, yeah. uh, you know, the, the sensation that, you know, you think they're beautiful anyway? Well, I know in the, well, some that immediately come to my mind, and you'll probably have them pop up too, is in the, um, in the Middle Ages, uh, the religious paintings of hell. So when there's yeah. a lot of them, uh, paintings of um, people traversing the levels of hell and large demons coming up and swallowing people, you know, um, medieval torture devices and people being flayed open and birds eating their entrails and whatnot and horrible things like babies. And I won't elaborate, but, you know, 1500s, 1600s, I think that those are incredibly horrifying to see and upsetting and also upsetting to know that they they would study the Bible and that was the conclusion that they came and how horrible that would be and that they felt the need to draw it out. Uh, and I think that that though, I, I still find, find a sort of beauty or joy in looking at them because how incredible that they took their, their knowledge of scripture or other, you know, um, scriptural works that may not be in our Bible today or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and they, the fact that they took that knowledge and they wrote this all out and that when you look at it, it's not meant to be perfect. It's meant to actually illustrate exactly how hell is like and the things that are supposed to happen in it. That's really incredible to me. And also just that it really, really puts across the anguish and the gnashing of teeth. It really conveys that so incredibly well. And you're just sort of like inspired when you look at it and the horror, you're like, wow, you really, you really needed to have some skill to horrify me this much. Mm -hmm. So I think that's maybe one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, one of the, cause I have said that I'm reading this Dennis Dutton book for fucking months now. I think <laughs> anyway, he is it's... cluster criteria. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I finally got through that chapter. Uh, um, yeah, the, he he talks about he talks of in, in in that very the one about the cluster criteria for art. He talks about the he talks about an interesting comparison of the de that which is being depicted versus the depiction itself. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about a mountain, you know, you have the mountain, 
you can look at it with your eyeballs, the real mountain and the mountain depicted in the painting. Mm -hmm. So, and about how those things can kind of be appreciated separately and in different ways. And yes. in terms of appreciating that, uh, the depiction of, because yeah, I, I agree with you completely. It's like if, it's like the Hieronymus Bosch and that crazy shit that he painted. <laughs> Um, yeah <laughs> of yeah the garden of earthly delights and it's like what did this yeah. what was this guy but you know n never mind the subject matter it's like so precious so preciously done and loving yes. it's loving oh, what a good lovingly, word. yeah and lovingly mm -hmm. done you know it's like you know because when you care about something that's how you treat it yes you, with care thoughtfulness and just Oh my God, this line has to be, it can't be this way. It has to be this way. You see what I'm saying? So, yes. so that's, oh, that's yeah. such a good way to describe it. Yes. Yeah. Meticulous. So that's, that's really moving. Yeah. Meticulous. Yeah. It's very moving mm -hmm. to see the desire to see that, uh, to see that conveyed in the work of art. Uh, when, mm -hmm. when the person has been dead for, I don't know how long now, yeah. I mean, I guess he's a medieval guy too. So, and it's like, what more than, more than half a millennia or something. I don't know. Um, he's probably dead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he might be dead, you know, not even a carcass anymore. Uh, <laughs> so then I think it's really cool when the work of art transcends mm. uh, the artist, what it was talking about or whatever, and the visual aspect of the work to kind of contradict what I was saying earlier about beauty, the, the, the information conveyed in the work of art kind of moves beyond all of that and it's able to stand on its own that way and still be kind mm -hmm. of mind-blowing that's really cool it is yeah. i agree yeah yeah, yeah. took the words right out of my mouth <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's 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 really cool okay um um okay mrs bdx we have broken the hour long mark of our conversation uh and this has been really fun so i'm gonna uh, start sorry so i'm gonna start to close it out uh time i think okay. went by a bit because we i don't know but you i just love talking time. with you yeah, Me that too. was great. <laughs> yeah, that was really mm -hmm. great. So is is there anything you would like to add? Um, is there where can people find your work? Is there anything you're excited about? Uh, any projects yeah. you have coming up? What anything? Well, I wanted to say thank you so much for having me on and what a fun conversation to have with somebody who loves art and JP as much as I do. <laughs> yes. And I just I had a blast talking with you. It was so wonderful and edifying. And um yeah, so if anyone wants to find me, I am on abbylynart.com or my Instagram. Um, I'm also on abbylynart on Facebook. I have that. And then my profile on Instagram is abbylynart underscore. You can find me there as well. And, um, but yeah, things I'm looking forward to. Hmm. I'm looking forward to. I have not gotten a chance to draw or paint my son yet so I'm very yes and doing, yeah and doing uh portraits and and whatnot I just I felt like it's been such a big thing and I'm so excited to do it and now he's just this squishy little 13 month old <laughs> and I think it's time so yeah, be on yeah. the lookout for it <laughs> yeah yeah I was gonna say that you have like endless subject matter there <laughs> oh my whole phone is full <laughs> yeah 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 that's cool I'm excited to see those too okay Thank you. Lovely. Yes, you're so very welcome. Uh, thank you, Abby, for joining me. Thank you for your time, your words, and your thoughts. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Feel free to let Abby and I know what you think of this conversation in the comments. I encourage you to like this video and share it with any and all pertinent individuals as it helps this the channel and this, and this, uh, this way more people can listen to these interviews. Finally, I invite you to subscribe to my audiovisual channel because I have more conversations scheduled. If you want to support Abby, myself, this podcast, or all three, the links will be in the show notes. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, and see you next time. Bye. Bye.